Ready to start? Hello, uh, my name's Tim Martineau. I'm from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, where I'm a health systems researcher and I have particular interest in human resources and fragile and conflict affected contexts. Uh, I've worked um, on the consortium called Rebuild that looked at strengthening health systems after conflict and crisis. And I currently work on the successor Rebuild for Resilience. I'm also a member of the advisory group of the HSG thematic working group on health systems and uh, conflict affected states, um, which is why I've been asked to chair this session. Uh, if you don't know about the group, please do uh, check it out. We have over a thousand members um, and it's a great way of uh, sharing information um, across different groups and so on. So today we have the um, uh, the uh, talks will cover different aspects of information systems um, and also the use of information for service delivery in a difficult context. Uh, the way of working is we'll go through the pre-recorded um, presentations first. Uh, and I'll introduce each speaker uh, just before we start. Um, and then uh, we have an opportunity for questions and discussion. So please, uh, as the um, session proceeds, do think of questions, put them in the live Q&A box. And if you want to direct them at any specific speaker, then uh, give the name for the speaker. Before we do that, um, we want to just find out what kind of people we have got uh, watching. Um, and I wanted to do a little poll. Uh, so this is about uh, your links to information systems and the uh, what here we're calling difficult circumstances, uh, elsewhere sometimes called fragile states, conflict affected states. Uh, and so on. So I'm going to start the poll and just give you a couple of minutes to fill that in. Thank you, we're getting a few responses in. We'll let that just run for a bit, but I think we'll then start the uh, first presentation. Uh, and uh, to all panelists, forgive me if I um, stumble over the names a little, um, but the first uh, speaker is Dr. Fekri Duryab, and he's a public health expert. Uh, working on working on strengthening health systems for preparedness and response in conflict settings. And he's based at the Institute of Research and International Assistance at Akon University in Berlin and Heidelberg Institute of Global Health in uh, Germany. So his talk is on the implications of uh, electronic disease surveillance systems EDUs for short, uh, for health information systems in fragile countries. If we can start the presentation. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, I will talk today about the implication of EDUs for health information system in fragile countries, taking uh, Yemen as example. So uh, this um, uh, EDUs is part of the uh, health security uh, interventions in Yemen focusing on the detection component and EDUs is an electronic disease early warning system. EDUs is a, a health facility based surveillance system. Uh, it's um, 
web or uh, mobile based application where the health facility entered their weekly reports through the um, health uh, through the android application and uh, each um, disease or uh, focusing on the infectious disease each each one of these infectious disease has a case definition and a formula for a logarithm where this uh, system can issue an alert if the number of the infectious disease are in more than the threshold um, uh, in this uh, formula. So at this point, the district level start the validation process where they starting validate the data through the uh, mobile uh, phone or mobile call uh, confirming uh, the case definition and then they send the rapid response team to do the field investigation and take samples which can be sent to the uh, uh, laboratories and then they send the feedback again to the health facility to confirm if there is really through um, out, uh, alert um, for outbreak or not and uh, this uh, data also uh, goes directly to the governorate and national uh, level after the, the validation and at this point uh, they built uh, the uh, polythene which uh, should be disseminated to all stakeholders uh, within uh, almost two days from the reporting uh, time. So, um, it used really uh, by, by default is completed. I mean, the reporting is complete. Uh, the completeness of the report is really good and high in it use. However, we have uh, some challenges in the timeliness and also the accuracy of data. Uh, so um, uh, we found that uh, in it use, 14% uh, of the immediate uh, alerts uh, got investigated or verified within the first 24 hours, while 90% in the second days. So uh, for these diseases or group A, we call it, uh, which are the uh, most uh, uh, out, uh, I mean, disease can cause outbreaks in Yemen, which is need uh, rapid response within the 24 hours. We found this uh, um, uh, this uh, challenge is in the uh, rapid uh, investigation. So that can cause delay in response. So at the second point of delay, we found it this in the dissemination. We found uh, uh, it was good at the beginning of establishment of the idiots, but it become delayed. Uh, up to nine days um, in 2016 and 2017. Um, the challenge facing the EDUs, actually, uh, um, uh, in addition to the um, security situation in Yemen and also uh, to the uh, access to the internet, we have uh, uh, one big challenge is the rapid expansion of the program. The program started in 2013 uh, in four governorates, a representative sample of 100 health facilities. And then it's uh, from 2013 to 2017, the program expanded fastly and, uh, to, and now cover whole Yemen, 333 district and almost more than 2,000 health facilities. Um, in compare, on the other hand, the workforce or the human resource uh, were uh, still um, uh, was still um, uh, limited, uh, and no, almost is the same as it started in 2013. The verification also one of the big challenges because of the security, the people or the field investigators cannot go to the uh, some areas due to the security situation and also due to lack of uh, the um, skilled persons. The third reason for the uh, verification also lack of the financial support. 
Uh, the lab also uh, one of the biggest challenges in Yemen facing uh, facing uh, uh, this uh, uh, project. Uh, we have only a few uh, central lab where they can do the investigation. For example, in uh, COVID-19, there were only uh, four uh, laboratories in uh, whole Yemen that can uh, um, do the um, uh, PCR test. Uh, now it's become six, but still it's not enough for the whole Yemen. Uh, the dissemination, as I mentioned, is one of the uh, problem, uh, the delay in uh, disseminating the information to the stakeholders that also uh, and also the finance resource, which all these uh, challenges can lead to delay in the response um, uh, uh, to the um, alerts that produced by the EDUs. And another uh, um, uh, challenge is uh, this um, um, system is applicable uh, or it's health facility based. Uh, system, it's not community-based, so only uh, can give alerts for those who have access to the health facilities. But at the community level, there could be a lot of diseases were not really detected um, at uh, um, earlier as possible. So in conclusion, the EDUs is a crucial component of health system in Yemen and have proven to be useful in organizing a humanitarian health response in general and infectious disease control in particular. Uh, EDUs is a pioneer uh, software from its experience in Yemen, include relative resilience and robust, robustness of EDUs, may also inform health agencies and authorities in similar fragile conflict prone and debriefed seating on how to cope with the threat of infectious disease and epidemics through outbreak detection and enhancing rapid response during a conflict, not only during a conflict, also in a developing situation such uh, w w uh, we saw that uh, how we need such um, a software rapid response program during the COVID-19. Uh, the key factor of the success of it use are its resilience and basic mobile technology that does not uh, need a high speed connection and simple structure of codes and routines. That's all, thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fakhri. A very interesting presentation uh, and very nice uh, way you presented the, the whole thing as a system with all its component parts and identified the, um, the challenges at, and many of them uh, at each stage of, uh, of the system. A very helpful uh, diagnosis of that. And also you introduced the challenge of rapid scale up when you're trying to uh, develop a, um, and implement a system. Thank you. Um, we move on to uh, Dr. Michel Anya Montes. He's a research fellow at the University of York. Um, I assume that's the one in the UK. Uh, his talk uh, is on the challenges of getting accurate data um, in these difficult contexts uh, that we talked about. So his talk is called a robust health-related data collection through surveys in post or and conflict settings, uh, lessons from a study in Colombia. So let's hear that one, please. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, here we are uh, proposing at uh, Salvi to measure the recording errors and how we can use this in a uh, post-conflict settings. So this is our motivation. So there, there is a conflict, there was a conflict in Colum from Colombia that caused many, many deaths and more than 6 million displacements. And after more than 40 years, there is a peace accord that was signed in 2016. But now finally we can measure uh, the, the effects of conflict on, on mental health and physical health. So, uh, as many conflicts around the world, uh, the researchers 
are usually relying on the how and on the answer of those for, for people. Um, and this can this can have recalling errors. So what here we are proposing is that we can test uh, if these uh, errors are are systematic or not, and if these uh, recalling errors uh, are, are affecting our outcomes or not. Uh, so here's uh, what, what, what we have in Colombia. In Colombia, we have uh, at least three or more barriers. And uh, in the first map, we can see that there is areas that that is that are heavily affected and areas that are lightly affected. So we will use this kind of design to test uh, if the peace agreement is affecting uh, health outcomes or not. And our first approach is that uh, we are asking the same questions uh, from 2014. So in 2018, uh, in the first wave of this questionnaire, we are asking uh, uh, health-related questions from 2014. And one year after, in 2019, we are asking again the same questions from 2014. So is there, is there, this period is 2014, is before the peace agreement. So, if the, if the recurring errors are not systematic, so if the recurring errors varies randomly across these uh, uh, geographical areas, we will argue that it is not affecting the evolution of impact of health outcomes. Impact of evolution of health outcomes. So, uh, and this is our second approach. Our second approach is that we are uh, asking in 2019 for a well known event. In 2014. So, the difference between this one and the, and the previous one is that in this case, we know the correct answer. So, we know what the output is. So, we will see if the recurring errors of this well known event is again random across these uh, geographical areas. And if it is not, uh, that is not affecting the, health, the impact evaluation of health, of course. So uh, this is the Meta Department in Colombia. Uh, we see here that we have uh, not affected districts, lightly affected districts, and heavily affected districts. Uh, here we apply two eight uh, questions. Uh, and we got 15% uh, of attrition uh, in the second wave, but we included 10% of what happened in the first wave. So we can. Uh, uh, mitigate this, this kind of attrition. And in table one, we see the, the attrition, that the attrition is not related with uh, conflict intensity. So we, uh, we can argue that uh, the attrition is also random here, so it's not affecting our, our, our impact correlation. Uh, here we have the variation results for the capacity between 2019 and 2019 answer that is that uh, from health status that are self reported. And uh, we see, for example, in the first column that the question is uh, if you have electricity power in 2014. And those uh, recalling errors, because in 2019 we asked again the same question, those recalling errors uh, are not related with, uh, with violence intensity across the districts. And we see that uh, on our evaluation we have some, uh, some uh, significant statistical significant coefficients, but those are kind of random. That even though if we got some, some of them, if we pick some of them, we can say that uh, for hospitalization, maybe there is a systematic error, and we can know where what reactions is there is the recording error. But this will also help in our interpretation. And this is the results for uh, flashball memory test. That is, uh, we ask what the stage this Colombia are reaching the 2014 FIFA World Cup in Brazil, and the correct answer is quarter finals. And we ask this question five years later, uh, and we see here that this error, this recording error, are not systematic across the, the, the affected or not affected districts. So what we argue that those recording errors are not 
affecting our impact evaluation. So here's our conclusions. Uh, we, uh, what we see here is it is possible to gather reliable information, but it's good information. Uh, and, those, and, and now we have a test to see if we can rely on those or not. Uh, the difference between the reliability of, uh, of the questionnaire, that is the internal reliability and this one, is that we know that uh, uh, the correct answer of the past event. So we can know if the recording errors are systematic, uh, systematically uh, uh, related with the conflict areas. So, so we are here introducing two kinds of questions, and we are uh, suggesting that uh, future research, not only in conflict uh, settings, but also uh, information that we need to rely only on uh, uh, self-reported information, we can apply uh, these suggested tests. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, a different aspect of health systems, um, particularly looking at accuracy. And uh, I mentioned our work in, in Rebuild. We found uh, that um, by definition, you were going back and asking people uh, what they remembered and recall was an issue. Um, we did uh, use more qualitative research methods as well as quantitative um, to address this. And uh, maybe later I'll um, put some information in the uh, discussion box um, about one of the papers that was done using life histories, which is a way of, of capturing this. Um, we don't uh, have Missile with us at the moment. We're hoping he might still join. So if there are questions, please, and I see people are already using the live Q&A box, uh, please put those in. Um, and uh, if, if we're not able to uh, have him join, I'm sure we can pass them on to him. Um, <clears throat> and I liked his uh, reference to remembering World Cups. Um, I'm not a huge uh, football fan myself, and I'm afraid that wouldn't work very well for me. I would uh, forget uh, who had won when, except, of course, England in 1966. But, uh, um, so now we move on to uh, Dr. Chiara uh, Altari, who's a researcher focusing on uh, measurement methods and monitoring outbreak response and a health, health service provision in humanitarian settings, so in these difficult settings. Uh, she's an assistant scientist at John Hopkins Bloomberg School, School of Public Health in the Center of Humanitarian Health in, in the US. So um, her talk is about um, looking at the issue of making health information collection more appropriate to the context because lots of work has been done on designing health information systems, but how do they, uh, how can they be made to work more effectively in these difficult contexts? And her talk is entitled Measuring Results of the Humanitarian Result uh, Response, Adapting Public Health Indicators in Out of Camp Setting. So if we can hear that one now, please. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Chiara Altare, and I'm assistant scientist at the um, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, the work I'm presenting today focuses on um, measuring results of humanitarian action and the need to adapt public health indicators uh, to different humanitarian settings. Just a few words about the, the background. Uh, as we all know, uh, humanitarian emergencies have become a major public health risk factor um, that affect millions of people worldwide. Data are often lacking from these settings, um, despite their importance to um, define priorities and uh, monitor uh, progress. 
over the years, however, many initiatives have been conducted to improve both quality and availability of public health information including uh, the definition of some um, so core indicators in order to uh, streamline monitoring efforts. And certainly things have improved over the years and um, however uh, the majority of the indicators uh, still focus on uh, process and output providing little information as to whether the um, expected results of humanitarian action have actually been uh, achieved. And another major constraint is that indicators are often not feasible in uh, uh, challenging settings. So the work we have conducted try to address uh, some of these issues uh, with a slightly different angle. Uh, our aim was to develop an approach to identify and adapt outcome indicators to different contexts. Overall, we built upon uh, methods and indicators already used by humanitarian actors uh, we defined outcomes as both uh, the health status of the population as well as both coverage and quality of interventions and we aim to recommend indicators that are feasible in uh, humanitarian settings as well as backed by evidence and useful for uh, decision making. Uh, our, so the work uh, unfolded through several steps. Uh, we started with a review of the literature to uh, extract indicators. We then developed a theoretical framework and then we moved to the development of a method to assess and operationalize indicators. The indicators that we identified were then um, piloted in three humanitarian crises and finally all the feedback was consolidated. In today's talk, I'm only going to focus on the framework and on the operationalization of indicators, as these are two uh, key components of the, of the approach we uh, developed. So first of all, we started with a framework, uh, which uh, was developed around construct, subconstruct and dimensions. So constructs are uh, thematic areas about which information is needed in humanitarian settings. So these include mortality, morbidity and nutrition, as well as information about the performance of the health services, uh, acute, chronic, preventive care services, as well as the um, so preventive practices conducted by the population, as well as um, health system, broader health system blocks. As you can see in this table, um, within, each sub, within each construct we had we have identified some more granular subconstruct that define specific aspects of the thematic area. So, for example, morbidity has been divided into age-specific and uh, cause-specific. And finally, uh, there is the dimension which refer to the type of outcome we are interested in. And this again can be health status or uh, coverage or quality of an intervention. Certainly not all constructs are relevant in all crises and at all time, but the, uh, the idea here is to choose the one that are more relevant and focus on uh, uh, one specific indicator that could measure this dimension. So once we developed the what we need to measure, we had to find a way to identify and operationalize indicators for humanitarian settings. So we uh, decided to use a two by two table like the one you can see on the slide um, because this is a sort of simplification of reality that describe humanitarian settings in terms of two main parameters and these are access so access to population and or to health facilities and resources and we think that these two parameters um, strongly affect the way in which data can be collected and the data sources that are available and so basically we, what we did was to develop one of these tables for each subconstruct and dimension. And then we identified one tracer indicator based on the criteria that you can see on the right. Um, and then we provided four alternatives. And uh, these alternative indicators are tailored to the specific cell in this table, which means they are tailored to the uh, specific humanitarian context and the uh, specific level of access or uh, and level of resources. Um, so what to give you a more uh, concrete example, uh, here you can see the two by two table that we developed we developed about coverage for antenatal care. As you can see, the tracer indicator 
focuses on attending at least four ANC visits during the most recent pregnancy. And this indicator is recommended in uh, the four cells. However, in each cell, there is a, it, the same indicator is measured in a different, with a different method, uh, which is feasible in the given cell. And uh, this is indeed one of the main um, aspects that we have noticed in, uh, while conducting the work. Uh, namely that the, the context and the access and uh, resources highly affect your method more than the definition of the indicator per se. Um, this table, for example, um, summarizes the different methods that are feasible in different contexts and they go from um, population-based surveys when access to population is granted through uh, relying more on health facilities or administrative estimates um, when access to health facilities is, is only possible up to more uh, um, remote monitoring or sentinel site approaches in settings where both access and resources are limited. And these methods are already used uh, by humanitarian actors, however, in a scattered way, so in an in a inconsistent way. So our work really tried to systematize the way in which uh, public health indicators can be measured in different humanitarian settings. In conclusion, we developed 60 of the two by two tables um, that I've shown earlier on, one per each uh, subconstruct and dimension of our theoretical frameworks. And these tables systematize which method can be used in which humanitarian settings. Um, adapting measurement methods is required to make best use of the available data and ensure that available evidence is used to inform decision. Certainly, however, different measurement methods require different interpretation and aggregation approaches. And that's why we are focusing, uh, so the emphasis is really on the uh, analysis and interpretation of data, and we are developing uh, specific guidance for each of these two by two tables. However, we are also, um, so our next steps include uh, validation of the requirement of how to implement uh, this assessment method, as well as the um, operationalization of how, how to move from one method to the other, and how to aggregate in a, transition from one cell uh, to the other. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Um, and it's important there, it, it nicely shows the systematic way of adapting the, uh, the public health indicators to the specific context that we're talking about. Very difficult uh, uh, areas to work in and uh, focused on two particular stages of that of that process. So we've had three uh, presentations that are um, much more about the design of the health information system which we have to get right uh, in the first place. We now move on to two more uh, presentations which are more about the practical application um, of uh, health systems in the field for specific areas of, of service delivery. So the next one is uh, from Mrs. Aya Nubani, who's a, an epidemiologist and researcher focusing on mental health and NCDs uh, services at primary care uh, level in um, fragile states and uh, she works as a project coordinator and researcher at the Global Health Institute at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. So her talk is about as a, uh, understanding um, about actually using data uh, to, to understand a particular health problem better. And it's entitled Examining the, examining the dynamics of access and utilization of mental health care services in contrasting fragility context in the Lebanon. Uh, so let's hear that now, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. 
I'm Aya Nubani, a project coordinator at the Global Health Institute at the American University of Beirut. And today I'm going to present the study entitled Examining the Dynamics of Access and Utilization of Mental Health Care in Contrasting Fragility Contexts in Lebanon, the Healthcare Providers and Communities Perspective Study. So uh, our study is funded by the National Institute for Health Research and it comprises a research team from uh, in the Institute of Global Health and Development from Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, as well as our researchers from the Global Health Institute at AUB. So uh, starting with the burden of mental health in Lebanon, there's limited data and lack of epidemiological data on the burden of mental health problems in Lebanon. Reported studies show that 25.8% of a cohort of adults uh, suffer at least from one disorder and 105 experienced more than one disorder. Having anxiety as the most prevalent and uh, followed by mood disorders. Another survey was done with the Syrian refugee that showed 12% of those surveyed suffer from either physical or mental disability and both the studies show that there is a lack of um, treatment or seeking treatment uh, professional from professional care. So the aims of the study is one to examine how community members, Lebanese and Syrian refugees, as well as primary healthcare providers perceive mental health. And two is to understand the dynamics of health seeking behaviors and the main issues faced by the user in their health seeking journey. Three is to determine the health system's ability to address the burden of mental health issues with a view to identify opportunities for strengthening mental health and psychosocial support service implementation. Now, briefly, for the method, um, we adopted a qualitative comparative study design. The study consisted of 55 semi-structured interviews and 60 group model building workshops. It was uh, conducted in two contrasting fragility contexts, Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, and the Bekaa area, the rural areas of Lebanon. And we, it was conducted with two different population community members, including Syrian refugees and Lebanese host community, as well as healthcare providers at primary care centers. So for the results, um, starting with the causes of mental health, uh, when discussing the um, uh, onset of mental health issues, community members identified diverse stressors and they were summarized in four major uh, categories. One is the long-term effects of exposure to wars and violence. Um, two is the integration challenges between the community members, the host Lebanese community members and Syrian refugees, especially in the Bekaa area, resulting from the political and social effects of the Syrian crisis and the displacement of Syrian refugees to Lebanon. And the three, the socioeconomic constraints, especially the issue of uh, uh, unemployment and the, the expense, uh, the life expenses. And for the gender expectations and the patriarchal system in Lebanon, especially in the Bika area where men are in, more in control, while women uh, are responsible for their family tasks. Now, when comparing the causes identified by uh, community members with those of the healthcare professionals, they were very consistent, except that healthcare providers uh, reflected more on how genetic predisposition and the, uh, had a role with mental health, as well as a bidirectional relationship between physical health and mental health. Now, for the factors affecting the rate of health seeking, we were able to identify social stigma as one of the major barriers. And the social stigma was fueled by the lack of knowledge and awareness to mental health issues. And it was found common among the, within the community and even among healthcare professionals, as mentioned by both the community members and healthcare providers. We were also able to identify diverse routes for health seeking, and they were similarly described by both categories, the community and healthcare providers. So people at first seek help from their family and social circle, followed by coping adopting coping mechanisms, and the final resort is usually the health system and the professional care. When community members were asked about the barriers for seeking support from the health system, we were able to identify three main barriers. One is the mistrust in the quality of the service due to the lack of the community, uh, the, the lack of trust and the ability of the provider to listen and support confidentially, and the lack of the community and the ability of the specialist to treat. 
Two is the lack of awareness to available mental health services and the limited availability of these services, especially in the Bekaa area. Now, for this slide, we are summarizing uh, the findings um, identified by healthcare providers. So we were able to conclude that the health system in Lebanon is geared toward um, uh, treating physical uh, issue, health issues rather than mental health issues. And we were able to compare emerging themes with the person-focused care framework. Therefore, we identified the three main barriers for person-focused care. Uh, one is the lack of a cohesive and coordinated health information system. Two is the limited human resource capacity for mental health due to limited training. And the three is the limited service integration and coordination, which is a major challenge for addressing mental health in Lebanon. But we were able also to identify facilitators to adopt a more person-focused care where healthy professionals were showing their willingness to uh, build the trust and open relationships with patients. To, to uh, healthcare providers mentioned that they perceive mental and physical health as interrelated phenomena that should be treated coherently and in conjugation with each other. And the three healthcare providers showed their concern with the evolution of people's experienced health problems. Now, when we were able to identify points of fragility, community members mentioned that the availability of finances, unemployment, political instability, and the corruption in Lebanon were major issues affecting their mental well-being. However, health professionals focused more on social stigma, the violence at the community as main concern that should be addressed in order to improve the mental well-being in Lebanon. And at the health systems level, there's limited availability of services due to the lack of fund and uh, allocation of funding. The strategies discussed by the participants, uh, starting with the communities, both uh, communities, Syrian and Lebanese, wanted better job opportunities, wanted to increase um, uh, a better, better salaries, and they want uh, intervention that fight stigma and reduce the social tension. However, for healthcare providers, uh, they were focusing more on improving public awareness and more investment uh, for the mental health sector. Finally, it's the first qualitative comparative study using the system dynamics approach. We were able to identify two causal loops that act as a framework to gain insights into the contextual specific factors influencing mental health. And as recommendations, these findings will help us come up with intervention that um, addresses this issue of social stigma and uh, geared toward more gender and integration sensitive strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aya. And, and your presentation uh, shows a different aspect of uh, health information that is needed for uh, thinking about appropriate service delivery. And uh, one of the things I put, picked up was the, the sensitivity of the area, obviously, of mental health. And the fact that this is a barrier stated by the community um, and part of the problem seemed to be the lack of trust of the, uh, of the health system. Very interesting, this contrast with um, a presentation given earlier today uh, on community health workers in um, Sierra Leone and their involvement in vaccination coverage. Uh, it showed quite the opposite, that it was because of the trust in the community of the uh, community health workers that um, uh, the uptake of the immunization was so good. Uh, and it's interesting that you also, again, gathering more information uh, on, on this complex topic, it seemed that the health workers were aware of some of the issues of uh, mental health and the, the challenges of the community and how they perceive things. But somehow there's a, a disconnect between uh, what the um, community say they find and what the health workers say they know. So this is very useful information then to act on to um, influence the improvement of the health service. So thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, again, if people have got questions for Aya, please put them in the box. She is uh, live here uh, and ready to take uh, the questions. And so we come to the last of our presentations. This is from 
Pamela Atim. She's a, a public health specialist by training, and she's a lecturer as well as the acting head of, public, of the public health department in Gulu University uh, in northern Uganda. So this is where uh, um, the most recent conflicts uh, have taken place in Uganda, um, ending uh, around the year 2006. So they're looking back at uh, the impact of that. And her presentation is about uh, using data to identify specific service needs. Uh, in this case, it's related to disability. Um, called Physical Dis Disabilities and Limb Loss in Northern Uganda, Prevalence, Characteristics and Effects on Victims' Lives. So can we have that presentation, please? My name is Pabela Tim from Uganda, and I thank the organizers of the Sixth Global Symposium on Health Systems Research. I want to share with you a story. And this story is about people living with disabilities, including limb loss in Northern Uganda. We well know that 15% of the world population live with some kind of disability. One fifth of them live with significant disability. The prevalence of disability is even higher in developing countries, especially in Northern Uganda, that suffered from two decades of civil war. People with disability are more disadvantaged than the rest of the people in terms of education services, employment opportunities, and social integration. And this actually leaves them behind and they're being stigmatized. This was a two year pilot study, which we implemented in eight districts of actually sub-region. Specifically, we wanted to look at how many people in the community could be having disability, including limb loss. Because we might assume that the limb loss or disability was a problem when actually it was not a problem. Secondly, we wanted to describe the lived experiences of people having disability. And thirdly, we wanted to pilot implementation of an outreach service van that provided orthopedic services and also evaluate its effectiveness and feasibility in the region. So what did we do? We conducted household surveys among 8,000 households, especially who are interviewing the heads of households using cluster random sampling, where a cluster, we defined it as a village, which is the smallest administrative unit in our region. These clusters were generated from the University of Manchester and the coordinates were plotted and maps generated that helped the research assistants during the interviews to reach the selected participants. Prior to interviews, we trained the research assistants on the study tools and oriented them on the research process itself. And also we sought ethical approvals at various levels from the University of Manchester and locally from Uganda the research participants provided informed written consent and the interviews were conducted in private places. We also conducted 16 focus group discussions with people who are having all forms of disability. And the main focus of the focus groups discussions were to find out how they got the disability, how they were coping with life, what challenges they face among other things. So what did we find? We found that about 48% of the people interviewed had some form of disability. Some were having hearing problems, others were having eyesight problems, and of whom 6% of them had lost limbs. And that was either loss of upper limb or lower limb. When we dug deep to find out the causes of the limb loss, we found there were three main causes of limb loss. The most uh, important cause was war related. It was uh, either someone was shot at with a gun during war or maybe stepped on landmine. The second main cause of loss of limb was um, injuries and accidents. And also the third cause of limb loss was due to chronic illnesses like diabetes. When we extrapolated this data into the general population of 37,000 people, 
we found that general disability stood at 10% and wild limb loss was at 1%, which is equivalent to about 11,000 people in the community. Our project was only able to support 50 individuals with artificial legs or limbs. Where are the others? We only managed to support only a small portion, which is like the tip of the iceberg. Where are the others? Further interaction with the community. Some people say they had received artificial limbs, as you can see on the picture, the lady wearing artificial limbs, sometimes back with the help of organizations working in the region. But now have withdrawn their services. And if, of those who even received the artificial limbs, they were complaining that these limbs are now worn out, they are not in good conditions anymore, and they are causing a lot of pain. So most of them had abandoned using the limbs. Whereas some of the people who had never received artificial limbs, they, the reasons they gave us were the, the services are far away from them. They were living far from the only hospital that provided orthopedic services to the community. Findings from the focus group discussions also further indicated that disabled people are still suffering. They are being stigmatized and left out. I want to quote, one of the participants said, a disabled person is looked as, at as useless in the community. If you have a beautiful wife, the healthy ones advise her to leave you, saying, what can a disabled person take care of you with? Another participant said, parents first send healthy kids to school, leaving disabled ones behind. And also in one of the focus groups we had, a gentleman shared with us and said when he was not feeling well, he was on wheel his wheelchair to one of the facilities. On reaching the health facility, he found that he was not able to access the care that he had gone for because the building did not have a provision for a ramp. In another focus group discussion, a lady shared with us a very touching story. And for her, she said she was impregnated by one of uh, the gentlemen who was working in the government settings. When she told the man that she was expecting a baby for him and they needed to go for antenatal care, the gentleman refused, saying that the lady would have shamed him. Why? Because the lady had lost one of her upper limbs. So this is what the community are going through. Whereas we are talking about engaging political, social, and economic forces in this conference, I think this is very timely and very important that we still know that the, the people living in our midst who deserve better health care, who deserve a decent life, who deserve quality health care, and they are being left behind. In conclusion, we found that more, many people in our community are still suffering from disability. Persons with disability are being left out. Yet the current services being provided are not with their needs. So we propose that a suitable alternative policy frameworks should be designed for a more equitable distribution of healthcare resources to meet the needs of this group of people in our community. Thank the Medical Research Council for the financial support, the University of Manchester for the collaboration, Gulu University, Ministry of Health Uganda, the district health offices for giving us the permission, the persons with disability organizations for linking us with the focal persons, and lastly, the participants for providing this information that we are now sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a very interesting uh, presentation there. Um, looking at the practical use of data collection, uh, different methods used, the survey, the focus group discussion, so you get some kind of triangulation of, uh, of what's going on. And then that feeds directly into decisions about, about service delivery. Now, uh, I think we have about 20 minutes left. Uh, just over. Um, I need to uh, check with my uh, conference organizer, but I believe we have uh, with us Chiara, Fekri and Aya. Uh, the other two speakers are not uh, available. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. 
Okay, so we've got three. Um, so could you please uh, use the Q&A box? Um, there has been a bit of discussion going on here um, be between two of you, and I, I'll pick up one of those um, questions. But if you have questions, more questions for Dr. Fekri and others for um, uh, Aya and Chiara, Dr. Chiara, that, uh, please put them in the chat box and I'll try and make sure that I, I capture them. Um, since this was a dialogue just between the two of you, I thought I'd pick this up and uh, Fekri give you a, a, the chance to expand a little. Uh, the question was, is the EDUs flexible to involve more diseases, including COVID-19 suspected cases? And if yes, how? So would you like to um, tackle that one, please? Yeah, um, actually- you uh, Put your camera on. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm facing a, a problem with the- Okay, camera. okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, I uh, yeah, uh, uh, for- for it use, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, for uh, for the it use actually uh, uh, designed as a flexible program where uh, more um, uh, events, uh, health uh, related events can be added at any time because it's, uh, I mean, uh, electronic application and the form can be electronic available for all health workers so it's flexible and for the COVID actually uh, within the list of the it use there is uh, the SARI uh, which includes severe acute respiratory infection uh, uh, COVID uh, is part of uh, this uh, group and uh, uh, earlier uh, in the week 17, 19, there were increase in this uh, uh, number of cases of uh, severe acute respiratory infection, but they didn't mention uh, COVID uh, by name. So, uh, uh, but for some reason, the dissemination stopped for several weeks and then when they uh, disseminated again, then they stopped report about uh, um, COVID or any uh, acute respiratory infection, maybe due to uh, some reasons related to the political and uh, country situation. Yeah. That's... Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. While you're on, uh, and I still invite others to uh, put questions into the chat box, um, I had a question. Uh, um, I was interested in the, you talked about the need for rapid scale up of this system um, to, to uh, have it used across the country. And I'm interested in how uh, you manage the quality of the system when yeah. you're rapidly scaling up or what, what you do to, because when you do it in a sort of pilot stage, you, you can put a lot of effort into that, but what uh, protections do you put in place to ensure that the quality is maintained as it's scaled up? Yeah, uh, I, I, I also, uh, this is, was one of the issues that we discussed the quality of the um, uh, data we get from this uh, program. Actually, uh, I'm, I'm with the principle saying quality is better, better than quantity. Um, uh, this EDUs was designed to be a sentinel site uh, program where just to sensitize the, the outbreak uh, uh, from uh, representative um, health facilities. But uh, uh, I mean, uh, there was a pressure uh, to, uh, to expand uh, and cover all functional health facilities uh, in, in Yemen. And uh, now it's cover uh, two, 2,000 health facility. Uh, we, we noticed that uh, the amount of information that received by the, uh, the system is really huge. And uh, with the uh, available uh, human resource in the program, working on the program, they cannot really uh, analyze the, the data and uh, 
uh, issues the report uh, timely. So a lot of quality issues are coming uh, in between to uh, show us uh, this program moved from the early warning to the normal or routine surveillance system. So I, I, I'm, I'm still suggested that if, if WHO and the Ministry of Health just focus on sentinel side. Even now we have, we, we are covering this 2000, but they can use random selection of health facilities as res representative for the situation in Yemen. And they focus on that in the weekly analysis and weekly report to show if there is a new uh, unusual um, diseases coming uh, or because it's easy to monitor the trend but with the, when they come overwhelmed with the information, so it's, it's a big challenge for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one more question while I've got you there from uh, uh, Dr. Chiara. She asks, um, I'd be curious to know more about the investigation team. Where is it based and how does the app, and how the, does the app facilitate their task? Yeah. If you can uh, briefly uh, uh, respond to yeah. that. WHO and the Ministry of Health, they developed rapid response team for each district. We have in Yemen 333 uh, district. So there, uh, th there, there is now, or uh, there are uh, 333 rapid response team for each district. So when uh, the alerts is come by district, so this rapid team should go and do the investigation uh, on time. But also, the availability of resources to do the investigation could be, uh, especially the financing issues, could be the challenge for this team. This is, uh, I mean, my response. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm not getting any new questions. Uh, at least I can't see any. Um, well, I will take the opportunity to, because I, I, I have a number that I'm interested in. And this one is for um, Aya um, and your uh, use of the, um, looking at the dynamics in, in, in the Lebanon. You talked about using health systems, um, sorry, you talked about using a model building to look at uh, system dynamics. Can you tell us a bit more about that and say what advantage it has in your opinion over uh, the focus group discussion, uh, which uh, Pamela used in Northern Uganda, if you know anything about focus group discussions, but tell us a little bit more about how it works and, uh, and uh, the practicalities of using it. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, today in the morning, we had the skills building session on group model building. So ah. it's, uh, yeah, so we had that uh, um, uh, session and we were explaining that uh, group model building, it's somehow similar to uh, focus a group discussions. However, um, all of the uh, participants are grouped in one room and they um, undergo certain activities in order to build that model. I did not show that model in my presentations because it's really complex. So I prefer to present the findings in order to be visually more understandable. But it's like a final model where we identify factors that are interrelated with each other that show the dynamics of each factor leading to another and how the uh, certain barriers are standing in the way of health seeking behaviors and uh, um, or a, a good quality uh, health service provision. So uh, what's good about it is it, it's a quick and like instant way of collecting data that helps you to understand the dynamics of a certain public health problem at the time, but definitely it's not representative. It gives you like a snapshot of a certain public health problem. But um, we also backed up these uh, workshops with the semi-structured interviews with the same target population group. Uh, not the same participants, but the same target population group in order like to provide more evidence and to back up the findings of the model. Yeah. And, and how easily do people um, uh, understand what to do and participate? Um, um, yeah. 
so for the community members, um, uh, our uh, research team was trained to use the lay language as much as possible and um, like to clarify the point of each section. So in group model building, there are three sections or three different activities. The first one is just a drawing rich pictures. Second uh, part is drawing a trend line uh, on uh, their perceptions of, a of the change and the burden of mental health problems. And the third part is to build the actual model. So uh, the um, facilitators definitely play a major role in like initiating the activity and the discussion and doing like illustrations in order to facilitate it. So community members were really engaged and entertained with that activity rather than just sitting and having these discussions for long hours. But for healthcare professionals, we had that attitude like we are healthcare professionals and you're inviting us for an um, for a workshop where you want us to draw and you're um, you, as if they are losing uh, time. But later on, like we tried, so it was a challenge with the, that uh, target group. But um, at the end, we tried as much as possible, like to explain and to elaborate that, okay, it's uh, uh, just like 10 minutes as an icebreaker to initiate the further discussions. So it depends on the uh, type of the group that we are doing um, the data collection with. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thinking that it wasn't proper, proper part of their job, maybe. Uh, uh, <laughs> good. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'm still looking at my box, but I don't have uh, further questions. So I'll take the opportunity of um, uh, asking now. I've got my notes here. Uh, Dr. Chiara, this was. Uh, for me, quite a complex uh, presentation. I don't know a lot of, ah, you're there, um, uh, about the design of health uh, of these uh, information systems. But I wanted to know, you know, you, you laid it out nicely, the different steps uh, that you were making, but what are the practical issues then once you get to the end of the uh, adaptation process of, of, of testing the approach in the real world? because uh, obviously you're designing something for um, uh, operating in a really difficult circumstances. So when, you, when you've done all the sort of more theoretical testing, what, what are the challenges um, when you get to the end of that stage? Uh, yeah, I think the biggest challenge is actually um, moving from one cell to the other in the sense that what we have done is identifying indicators that work in each cell. So for example, in a setting in which you have limited access, but you have some resources, uh, we have identified an indicator that is uh, feasible. So we suggest a method that works in this specific setting. But it's true that we know that humanitarian settings vary and evolve very um, so often and quickly. And so there will be the moment in which uh, we have to switch from one cell to the other. And uh, this will be the challenge. So the challenge would be then not only to switch, but also then how to make sense of um, the same construct measured in different way, and which is a bit the, the what we're trying to do is to see how do we pass the, or how do we use more this, the, this concept of constructs or of topic, instead of being stuck with the specific indicators that, the, that is measured in a certain way. Certainly there is the component of, um, you know, literally how to merge different data. And uh, uh, of course, if the same indicator is measured in different ways, we are not suggesting to copy paste and, and merge two lists or two figures that are then measured differently, but rather trying to understand what does one indicator tell me? What does the next tell me? And how can I make sense of this? Um, with the, the idea being uh, we need to, um, we need information in order to understand the context and then it's probably worth uh, trying to exploit all what we have as much as possible instead of, uh, you know, if you cannot do a survey, then you don't use any other information available because it's not the gold standard. And often we, we delay decision or we might take decisions that are not as uh, context specific just because we don't have the perfect data. Thank you. And, and what sort of, um, as, as researchers, what we're always looking for is um, uh, 
stakeholders who are interested in our results. We try to get buy-in from an early stage. How are you going about that and what sort of people are interested? Um, how, how might it be used when, when, when you've developed it? Um, so we have been working with uh, several organizations throughout the process, and uh, um, we have been close, so working closely with WHO with the emergency department, in the sense that they are also, um, so we are basically pro doing some complementary work on identifying indicators for uh, uh, that work in humanitarian settings. And then indeed we have been, um, so in the three pilot uh, countries, we've actually interviewed and uh, we, we went through the health information system of several organizations, not only to validate the indicators and to see if whether they were feasible, but also to see how this approach could be put in place. And indeed, a couple of actors um, would be interested in uh, in having a more uh, organizational um, pilot. No? So in the sense that now we looked at all possible uh, construct and also the um, so what you measure can be done at different levels. So it is different what the uh, the specific organization is measuring in, uh, I don't know where, in Mueso, in North Kivu, and what the ministry need to know in Kinshasa, and even more different what um, someone else outside has to do, has to, has to measure. So we, we, we will have also to adapt the, the indicators for organizations and for uh, level. Um, but yeah, no, there was some, um, I mean, it's always tricky to start to talk about the health information system in the sense that, of course, every organization has its own system and uh, uh, it takes always uh, a lot of effort to set up and develop. And so you don't want to change it too often. But there were, uh, um, especially the quality component was um, appealing in the sense that it's the less developed and that there are fewer standardized way to measure uh, quality. And so it was, um, so the many, many different organizations were interested in seeing how this could work in their own system. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, round up now since we, uh, oh, wait a minute. Um, okay, uh, we do have a question uh, coming. Thank you very much for that. Uh, this is a question for um, Aya. Uh, do you see, this is from Egbert Zondorp, who is uh, the co-chair of the uh, thematic working group on fragile and conflict affected states. And he says to Aya, do you see a scope for or come across mental health interventions by trained non-specialists in the con context of Lebanon? Sorry, Lebanon. And um, other web-based applications uh, all to be less dependent on existing health services with their limited resources. Is that question clear to you or can you see it in the box? And are you happy to respond? Um, yes, I'm reading it, but it's not very clear to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's take the first bit. Do you see scope for um, uh, mental health interventions uh, that could be used by trained non-specialists, because obviously there's going to be a shortage. Uh, we just have uh, under two minutes left. So okay, got... I, I don't know what uh, is meant exactly by trained non-specialists, but I came, um, well, within the scope of my project, uh, we are doing like some kind of evaluation to the MHGAP training that was conducted by the National Mental Health Program at the Ministry of Public Health. And the main aim definitely, it's, um, uh, it's developed by the WHO, which aims to train uh, healthcare providers at the primary care level on mental health, on screening, managing, and referring patients at the primary care for mental health. So um, there are several challenges, uh, I'm sorry, initiatives in Lebanon that are being done uh, for training healthcare providers that are not specializing in mental health uh, to uh, address the burden uh, or the mental health problems, especially among the um, disadvantaged population. So I don't know if I have answered first. Yes, yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good. Well, uh, we've had um, some very good presentations. Um, 
some uh, challenging questions. And uh, looking at the poll, um, there were uh, about half of them, half uh, of the people online are in the same position as me. They're neither um, information specialists or nor ones working specifically in uh, uh, fragile and conflict affected states. So I hope that's enlightened uh, you as well as it's uh, enlightened me. And I hope uh, we can continue this debate. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, we do have this uh, thematic working group, uh, which Egbert Zondorp is the co-chair of. Um, and uh, please look it up on the HSG website. It has its own web page and join the over a thousand um, uh, members um, to share your ideas. Uh, we're not alone in this area. This was an area that was uh, relatively unresearched uh, 10 years ago, but uh, a lot of work has been done. So please uh, link up with others and um, uh, let's all learn together. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting session. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, very Thank, you. Much. Thank you to all Bye -bye. the speakers. <laughs> Bye.